for being here somewhat late. Today is our cabinet day. Ask the organizers of this meeting to allow me to come a bit later and say a few words. At the very outset, I want to say that I am representing His Excellency the President of Sri Lanka. Uh, he has accepted your invitation, but today is a busy day, being cabinet day, and asked me uh, to represent him here. I'm particularly happy to be here because I have had a, a long association with the International Water Management Institute. In his long tenure as minister, I was also for some time the Minister of Irrigation. And uh, at that time, worked closely with this uh, institute. So, on my own behalf, also, I'm quite happy to be here. Uh, also, a word of welcome on behalf of the President to all our uh, distinguished foreign delegates. You are very welcome in Sri Lanka and uh, hope that you will have an enjoyable stay. Don't work too hard and uh, carry away good memories of your visit to Sri Lanka. I think this seminar comes at a very important time because almost all the countries represented here have had to face crises of some sort as a consequence of uh, climate change. Really, in the past, South Asia was not a largely vulnerable area. We used to think that floods, the disasters occurred in other areas which were dramatized. But that distinction cannot be made anymore. Our area has become also a highly vulnerable area. There's global warming, there's climate change, and also, there is a large uh, movement of urbanization. As you know, the World Bank has done studies in this. And they feel that in the next few decades, this movement uh, towards big cities, smart cities, movements of population uh, will become the order of the day. So that answer further complication in the sense that these cities will become vulnerable if these basic services, among which water is a very important aspect, and also other water-related uh, infrastructure areas. Uh, take Sri Lanka, for example. Uh, we, have, we generate about 30 to 35 percent of our power needs through hydro and we are also now the strong proponents of alternate energy because uh, South Asia in particular, we are not oil producing country. And uh, in the last few decades, uh, one of the biggest uh, demands on our funds, actually the outflows of our very uh, valuable and much sought after foreign exchange was in the area of payments for oil, for oil and other forms of uh, power generation. So that if you looked at budgets, I've been a finance minister for quite some time, uh, if you look at the Sri Lanka budget, we start working on the budget, you have to set off a large slice of your uh, funds, of your foreign exchange in particular, for oil. Just now we are going through a very uh, good time in the sense that oil prices have tumbled, but we don't know how long it will last. And anyway, it can't provide us a permanent sort of comfort zone because uh, very often countries, they get into a panic when oil prices go up. But when they come down, then you go into a, into a sort of stupor you know, till the next uh, crisis kicks in. So these are all uh, interrelated subjects and the greater attention we pay to this, the better. Uh, Sri Lanka experienced a tsunami in 2000, 
between 2004. And that was an unprecedented experience. And maybe if we had any knowledge of uh, this sort of disaster management of climate change, the death toll, the damage could have been minimized. Not only in Sri Lanka, but in South India and various places. Uh, even at basic things like uh, an information system, because today technology has uh, advanced, and uh, certainly for Sri Lanka post tsunami, uh, we have been able to link up with uh, global warning systems and also try to set up some organizations here. But one area which strikes me uh, is that. Uh, there's not enough integration in South Asia among these information systems regarding uh, environmental issues, regarding uh, global uh, climatic change issues. I see, I may be wrong, but I see a tendency for each country to sort of strike out on its own, as though uh, we're trying to invent the wheel by ourselves. And an institution like this can really set up uh, a good network. Because networking, I think, is a very uh, important matter. And secondly, again, I come back to this issue of uh, mass movements of population, which is characteristic of Asia. Uh, we know that the last couple of decades have seen very dramatic improvements in the economies of particularly China, India, and also Sri Lanka, but Bangladesh is doing extremely well now. It will be the leader of growth in our region. So all these countries have sh shown dramatic uh, economic growth. Uh, part and the Asia is the driver of growth. But now it is coming to a screeching halt to read the latest statistics coming out of China, the, the economic planning that is going on in India, uh, Vietnam, all those uh, leaders of economic growth during the last few decades have to have a complete rethink about their strategy. And everything suggests the global scenario that the old free market, uh, global uh, liberalization, that syndrome uh, is now, at least in the West, maybe when the consequences come to come East also, is subject to a lot of thinking. So we all, we ourselves have to rethink our strategies. It, they may have propelled us to some sort of economic growth the last three decades, but experience of the very recent past suggests so that we have to have collective rethinking because there is a seismic shift that is going on. And the earlier we recognize it and take action, the better it is for our, uh, see what is happening in the United States. But the Brexit campaigns, the impact it has on the European Union, all these have impacts on our economy. So in this realignment, I think we have to factor in very much these environmental changes and climate change. Some say that in China it is there's going to record limits in Japan and all that before the Kyoto agreement. But if you take a comparative uh, thing, we are on the cusp of, uh, of industrialization. So, question now is, are we going to follow that path or some other path? So it's very important, but this, all this has to be subsumed under the uh, notion of economic growth. How do you integrate these things uh, on the uh, area of a very important growth trajectory? This is something that we have to all now think about. Because what is happening in the world in the last three decades where everybody was very proud, we congratulated ourselves that uh, you know, 
we are leaders of growth, we are the engines of growth, and all that. And certainly, the, if you look at the statistics, that may be so. But something is, there's a gap. Particularly, I feel, in my own experience and thinking, that the underprivileged people of, of our country, people who have not had the same, uh, the benefits of a level playing field, they are waking up. The communication systems, uh, the natural disasters, all these are creating a new type of want among people who are uh, not satisfied. With Even the growth process may be attractive and you can write very many books and all that, but still there is a feeling of disquiet among people. That they are not getting the full benefit of growth. They are not getting uh, the full benefit of a uh, level playing field. So we have to look at all these environmental, climatic, global changes in terms of uh, finding solutions which are acceptable to a much larger group of people. Tendency has been, particularly in the environmental field, to concentrate on decision makers, on leaders. Uh, so many proclamations coming up, so many documents, so much of documents, documentation on uh, environmental change and uh, global activities. I think they become such a big mountain that that is a pollution by itself. <laughs> so that, that is that that may be necessary at the very beginning to sensitize people and leaders and so on. But I think it has to now move to a another plane. Where yeah. masses of people have to be involved in all these things. Now take the question of water in Sri Lanka. It's becoming a very big issue in, in Sri Lanka. Because if you look at the rate of growth, we have to think of the infrastructure. It is not only the, the big buildings that are coming up, the condominiums, the housing estates, all that. But uh, we have to provide the basic infrastructure. For example, uh, the domestic use of water in these rapidly expanding cities. So I want to suggest that the cabinet also will get in touch with you. We are asking the World Bank and you to do a water survey of Sri Lanka and see what is happening. Uh, how are we going to best utilize the rivers? We are very lucky. We have so many rivers. But if you look at the hydro uh, electricity development in Sri Lanka, we have now more or less exhausted the river valleys because you have to have river valleys for this where you can dam up the river upstream and use the water. Now that itself has other problems now. We have a very big problem because Sri Lanka we have what is called cascading system of uh, water use. The water that is impounded at the top of the, at the really which come, which starts from the uh, mountains are barricaded. But the water is used seven or eight times before it reaches the sea. In a sense, it's a very effective system because it sustains agriculture at a, at a large level. So water that is used higher up near the dam, again flows onto a stream. The streams come down to another set of uh, agricultural say, paddy fields or whatever. Then further and further and so on. So by the time the water reaches the sea, it has been used by about eight or ten sets of farms. That is why in, in Sri Lankan history, there is a saying by the very famous king who, uh, who sort of supported large-scale agriculture and tank building reservoirs. He was like a sort of ancient IWMI <laughs> many, many centuries ago. So he said, let not a single drop of water that drops onto this island go to the sea without it being used for the benefit of man. This was a famous sort of iconic statement and so on, which has helped Sri Lanka. Naturally. We are now self-sufficient in rice, more or less. We weren't 15, 20 years ago, but with the Mahavali scheme and so on. And we have a very good average yield, I think 60 to 65 percent. Uh, per acre. So I, I was told, I, I don't know if it is, and it's Indonesia, we have the highest 
in this part of the world, highest yielding per capita. So uh, there are so many pluses, but now we have come to a system where that itself creates difficulties with population growth and so on, because when, when you use this seven or eight times, the water, uh, the, the pesticides, the weedicides, all that is used uh, at the top, you know, or right along the way. When it comes down to the, the lower levels of uh, areas, and in Sri Lanka, those are the large areas. They have large scale uh, agricultural units. Then there are a lot of toxic uh, water. So that leads to kidney disease and so on, and things that were not there today, kidney disease has become a major problem. So what I just want to emphasize is that these issues, which are environmental issues, as well as in extreme cases, disaster issues, are now fundamental and increasingly more complex when it comes to uh, planning. So, we have, so all the countries that are represented here, we denote uh, rapid uh, growth. It was our uh, decade for the last two, three decades, all our countries have done very well. But now the time has come when we must take stock. And when we take stock, we have to go very much into the area of environment, of uh, making the best use of the environment, and see that we create a non-polluting or non-polluted world, a world that has not created further health and other problems for a rapidly shifting population. So this is a very serious and a much more complex matter than people take it to be. And that is why we have to be sensitive to it. And I welcome on behalf of the government and the President, the President your initiative. And I'd like to make a public uh, request of IWMI, we'll also ask the World Bank, multilateral agencies also, to help us in mapping out. So that uh, there is a lot of uh, departmentalism in this business. So I think it's very necessary to have a sort of synoptic view of what is happening. Uh, for a long time I've been interacting with IMA, with World Bank, ADB, uh, and all these uh, agencies been an owner of IMF and uh, the World Bank. And I can tell you that there is definitely a shift towards funding uh, projects that come into this area of uh, environment and uh, environmental <coughs> control and so on. But we need much more work, much more uh, project formulation. Okay. So while they are interested and projects can be uh, found, because each country has its own problem. Now in Sri Lanka we have now come to problems of uh, even, uh, of course, multilaterally we get the concessionary credit, so that is a big plus. Bilaterally sometimes the rates of interest, the period of repayment, other ancillary things like insurance, various other things, all are much more expensive. Even uh, where the partner government is accommodating, it, nevertheless it is more uh, expensive for the country that borrows than money from multilateral agencies. But the problem with multilateral agencies just now is that, uh, for example, IMF is much more engaged with Europe. They have it there huge problems there. So that funding, uh, attention, uh, so many specialists are going across the Pacific, <laughs> almost becoming a regular bus stop from Washington. They're all very much concerned with uh, what is happening in Europe, quite rightly so. But they have to stabilize the, the economic conditions, the economic structures. How they are going to do it now with Brexit and all this is different. The World Bank, I think, is also increasingly committing itself to Africa. The targets are more in Africa, but the needs are much more. Uh, the, by nature, as it were, the uh, Bretton Woods organization and also ADB and so on uh, are more LDC uh, focused rather than 
uh, the middle income country. Now all of us are, except Bangladesh, Bangladesh also has everything to be a middle income country, but the population is so large that it's more on the computation side that they are still the LDC. But most of the countries in South Asia are no longer LDCs or the classical deprived sort of lower end of the LDCs. We are not in that category. We are in the, more in the LDC category. Sri Lanka is very close to being a middle of the middle income category. So if you just take even the per capita income. So uh, these things have to be thought out. Funding itself also has to be uh, geared to these new realities. IMF getting more concerned about Europe and World Bank getting more and more concerned about Africa because ADB is our biggest partner. And now that's good news in the sense that you know, it's a new Chinese uh, back, I won't say sponsored, back, back that is coming up, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which is now up and running. And we have Sri Lanka is in, it's on the board of that. And we have taken a decision. AIIB has taken a decision to work together with existing uh, multilateral agencies to go for joint projects. So they are doing, a, they are doing, I think, a very sensible and a very uh, coherent approach. So that they say, well, look, we will. We are not in opposition to ADB or not in opposition to some other funding agency. We like to work together. In the long run, yes, eventually they will have, a, have that aspect. I can't say that everything is hunky dory. No, there will be competition. But there's larger ones available. But at the present moment, they will be working on collaborative ventures, and I think they have already started. So from the funding side also, we have to think more of domestic uh, resources. And one good thing about, uh, I think, dealing with problems of climate change is that we, that so much can be done through local initiatives. And uh, so we welcome this meeting. I look forward to your findings. And once again, I come back to the main theme that we are in a period of transition. And in that, our uh, networks, our linkages, will help us to save a lot of money. For example, especially in these early warning systems for disasters and so on, uh, this tendency for every country to start setting up its own, uh, you know, spending a lot of money, and you can easily intimidate ministers of finance by saying, well, this is like that, and all that. <laughs> so money is also freely given, but I am not convinced that a synoptic view has been taken so that we actually piggyback on global uh, warning systems intermediate systems and national systems. So it has to be a mix of all things. And a lot of work is being done uh, in the global uh, technology, I think, is growing very fast so that we could be the beneficiaries of this. So thank you very much. In particular, I think the